My name is Mick Kirsten, and I'm the President and CTO of Castoff Technologies and the lead of the Eclipse Myelin project. And in this webcast, I'm going to tell you about Myelin 3.0 and how it can improve your productivity to the point where you feel like you're coding at the speed of thought. So this talk is going to be all about the following equation. The fact that when we've got a feeling of flow and a focus, we're happy and we're productive. What I mean by flow is a psychological state where you become completely immersed in your activity. So if you're a musician, you might feel this when you're jamming with your band, or if you're really into a sport like skiing or soccer, and you're in the middle of doing that, you become completely engaged in what you're doing. You become completely immersed in this activity, and you feel the state of absolute engagement. And you get so focused that all the distractions, all the things that would normally interrupt you, they just go by the wayside. Now, the interesting thing is that this state is attainable when we're programming, and we thought it before. We feel it when we're pushing towards a release crunch, and we all of a sudden start feeling that we're 10 times more productive because nothing is getting in our way. We're just getting some coding and creative work done. The problem is that's not what we feel like day to day. And there are these forces that get in the way of flow and focus. Friction. Friction is this force that slows us down. Whether it's kludgy user interfaces, or slow machines, or needing to spend too much time configuring our development environment just to set up, download a bunch of jars, or set up a web application. When we've got this friction slowing us down from creative work, we're not in the flow. And then there's distraction. So distraction is this constant force. It's all the interruptions that often dominate our workday that keep us from being focused on what we're doing. And the net result of this is that we become a lot less productive. And we're not as happy, and we end up staying too long at work instead of getting this feeling of focus and flow that gives us this sense of elation and of productivity. So let's take a look at where the day goes. Some forces of friction that I mentioned are machine slowness. When our machines are slowing us down, that's getting in the way. Administration, when we're setting up our environment. And this other interesting one, constant searching. If we're looking for the information that we need, whether that's finding a jar that's a dependency, or it's needing to find a code sample or find the relevant code in the library that we're using. When we're searching, we're not actually writing code and we're being slowed down. This is just another source of friction. And distraction, multitasking. The fact that many developers, like many knowledge workers, period, will switch tasks dozens of times a day. That multitasking is another source of distraction. It's often driven by interruptions, whether those come from instant messengers and Obviously, we all have this problem of email overload. The fact that we're collaborating in such real time right now, we're collaborating so frequently, priorities are changing. The end result of this is that we're constantly distracted. So let's take a look now at where we've succeeded at reducing friction. We've got much faster machines. This is the inside of the machine that I'm sitting in front of right now. This is my ThinkPad C61P. It's got a core duo, and it's a blazingly fast machine. It's amazing. I, I simply do not wait for the compiler anymore, even though I've got half a million lines of source code on my machine. In terms of configuration, a really neat thing has happened. So the Eclipse development environment, the Eclipse tool platform, has made it possible to plug together tools in a very robust way. This means that I personally spend a lot less time configuring my development environment. It just tends to work. When I have to add a new tool to it, there are well-defined APIs and plugin models, which means that the tools interoperate well together. I'm not wasting my time configuring my setup, or I'm wasting a lot less than I used to be. And finally, there have been improvements on the operating system front as well. So the platforms that our IDs are built on, the platform that Eclipse is built on, they've, they've been improving in terms of robustness, in terms of their user interfaces, and in terms of meaning that we end up wasting less time on configuring our development environment and our operating system, whichever your, your OS of choice is. So these things are getting better. Our platforms are getting more solid, and they're getting faster. And now let's take a closer look at these platforms and make a comparison of these two key pieces of hardware that I use for programming. So on the left, we've got my laptop. And let's just see how they've changed since the 1970s. My laptop started out at having about 100,000 processors. That was my Texas Sinclair. And now it's getting close to 2 billion. My brain, on the other hand, started out at about 100 billion neurons, and have actually gone down since I was born. So I've actually lost some neurons, a lot of us do, over the course of these long nights programming or entertaining. 
And there's this interesting mismatch that's going on between our machines getting much faster, the platform's improving, and our brains staying at a constant speed. So let's, and at a constant power. So let, let's take a look, a closer look, at what's happened on the side of the laptop in order to deal with this Moore's law, with this tremendous increase in speed. The memory architecture of the laptop has evolved very significantly. So in this laptop that we're looking at right now, you've got all the things that you're used to, L1 cache, L2 cache, or the CPU, two different kinds of memory, very fast RAM, very fast video memory. But there are these other new architectures that the operating systems are making use of. There's a drive cache, that's a four gigabyte drive cache I have on this machine. And, this, and another four gig page cache that I've got. These are Vista Ready Boost and Ready Drive mechanisms. So in order to keep up with this very large hard drive, this very large main store, my laptop has got the structure of optimized memory systems. Now let's take a look at what my brain's memory architecture look like, looks like. I've got sensory memory, which is how I can perceive what's around me. I've got my working memory, which works with that to help with perception as well. And I've got the memory that I use when I'm programming. So this is long-term memory, which breaks into procedural memory. That's how I know how to use a mouse and a keyboard. And declarative memory. Now, declarative memory breaks into two different things. And it's very interesting the way this, the memory, this has only been known since the 1970s that our memory architecture is broken up in this way. Declarative memory breaks into episodic and semantic memory. So let's take a closer look at those because they're very relevant to how we program. And we can look at ways that we can use these memories better in order to keep us coding faster and faster. Semantic memory is our understanding of facts. It's how we know, if we're, you're an Eclipse programmer, it's how you know how core exception fits into the Eclipse architecture. If you're a web programmer, it's how you know how servlets work or how your XML and JSPs plug into things. It's based on reinforcement learning. So the more that you work with the Eclipse APIs, the better you understand those APIs. The more you work with web applications, the easier it is for you to build them. And as a result, the tools that we use today are built to assist our semantic memory. So we can't, when we're working on a large application, we can't understand all the semantics at once. We can't understand the whole structure of the application. So we've now got very efficient, very fast browsing tools and search tools that make it possible for us to navigate the structure of millions of lines of source code just by navigating trees. And it's, there's been this tremendous increase in these tools. Just If you're an Eclipse programmer, think of what's going on when you hit open type. You can now access instantly any type in the million line system. You know, some of it source code, some of it library code, and all that information is at your fingertips. In other words, the semantic structure of the system is completely explicit and it's all navigable, whether you navigate it in the containment hierarchy like you see here, or whether you navigate it with other hierarchies like type hierarchies. So our semantic memory is pretty well supported by the tools. We've got this other kind of memory. It's called episodic memory. And episodic memory is very different. It's our personal history of things. So it's how I remember what I did yesterday and how I remember what I did last week. And it's very different because it's a one-shot learning mechanism. It means that you only need one exposure to an event to, to know that it happened. You just know these things. And as an example, if you look bit geeky like me, think back to when you got your first cell phone. If that was an interesting event in your life, you instantly know that event. You don't have to try to recall it. And then what your mind does, what your brain will do, is it will bring in the relevant semantics. So you might remember the color of the phone, the person who sold it to you, or what the user interface was like. So this episodic memory is this very fast retrieval mechanism. Um, and it's this index over our semantic memory. And from Ed Edwin Colvin discovered it in the 1970s, and we now know that it's a completely separate memory system, or it's at least, at least it's a discrete memory system, because you can injure your episodic memory. There have been cases of people who've lost their episodic memories, and they can continue learning Wikipedia all they want, but they can't tell you what they're doing in an hour, or they can't tell you what they did yesterday. They just don't have that concept. So, what we noticed with Mylan is that we had this good support for semantic memory. We had these great tools that let you navigate structure. But systems got bigger, and those tools, even though they allowed us to navigate structure, they became completely overloaded. We, could, we, could, we simply cannot know what a million lines of source code, what it all plugs together like. 
And if we want to browse that structure, we would spend all day doing it. We noticed that we were spending a lot more time browsing the structure of the system than, work, than actually coding in certain scenarios. We were so loaded, overloaded with information that we spent all this time either doing searches, using open type repeatedly, or browsing these impossibly long hierarchies like you see in the Packet Explorer. And the key intuition behind Mylan is that for any task that we do, so for any bug that we try to fix or for any feature that we try to add, we only care about a subset of the system. We only care about a subset of the semantics. So what we've done is we've added this model into the IDE that captures the relevant episodes that you work on. And we call these tasks. When you're developing, you're adding features, you're fixing defects. Those correspond to tasks, either in your issue tracker or wherever else you've captured them. We've made tasks be a first class part of the development environment. Because we can do a really neat thing for you when that happens. We can allow you to activate the task to indicate which task you're working on, and then to show you only the relevant semantics. So instead of seeing the entire structure of the system, which could be hundreds of thousands of files, broken up into these structural pieces, which is really the, the way the compiler looks at the world, we can show you the way you think about your problem and the way that you're actually programming by sh using the same views in the IDE to show you only what's relevant to your task. And here, you can see that this task has to do with SWT, drag and drop, and working with this Java monitor. And that's what we call the task-focused interface. Instead of taking this compiler-centric, this structure-centric view of the system, we now have this task-centric view of the system. So let's start out by taking a look at the way this works and taking a look at how we brought tasks into Eclipse. So here I have my task list. And the way these tasks work is that you bring in, in you bring in tasks from an issue track or some kind of task repository. The example I have is Bugzilla. These are all of my Bugzilla issues, and I've got Bugzilla issues of other people I interact with. So here's one from someone called Frank Becker. And if I double click on these issues, so it looks like something was fixed here, I can see that this issue is now resolved. What Mylan does is it makes tasks a first class part of the IDE. You've got rich editing facilities for them. All the tasks, in this case, Bugzilla bugs, open offline. Um, I now see the synchronization happen in the background since I open this bug. Everything opens instantly, and I automatically see what's happened. If I see the other incoming changes on this task, on this task, I'll see anything else that had changed. And I can easily navigate the stream of comments over here. Everything is hyperlinked for me very nicely. If this is related to another task I'm working on, I can say see path 220313. Well, actually, O, that was meant to be zero. The good thing about Mylan 2.0 is I don't actually have to type task IDs anymore. I can hit control space, and I can navigate to a task with a single click this way. So you've got content assist for tasks as well right now. Tools will show you what they are. And again, everything opens inst instantly. Everything opens offline. Everything is very nicely linked. If you make this, if I save this task, so I hit the save button, it gets an outgoing change, which means that I can use this Mylan task list as a sort of inbox. I can manage all of my work in this single task list, setting up these queries for everything that I do. And we'll take a closer look at that later. Um, I just want to quickly give you an overview of the other facilities that you have in the Mylan task editor. This is a rich editor with offline support. Um, you can always get back into the web UI. If you want to use a, if you're not connected to the internet, of course, this won't work. Um, and it can be a little slower, especially if you're on a distributed project. So you've got the web UI here. Everything's accessible. But you've got some very nice, rich support in the Mylan task editor. For example, drag and drop attachments, everything that you expect, attachments from your desktop, from your workspace, all of that works. So I can drag this plugin XML file and simply attach it. I want to attach a screenshot. We've got all sorts of facilities for that as well. So I can capture my desktop right now, um, take a little screenshot of the task list right here, annotate it, because I want to show a little problem over here, and then click Next. And I get a preview of when I'm going to attach over here. So I actually cancel out of this right now, but I would have the screenshot attached. And 
you've got search facilities in addition as well. So you can organize your tasks in a task list. You can also search over tasks as well. You've got a very quick search facility over here. If I want to look at everything that has to do with sorting, I see every task that matches the word sorting. Um, you've also got a full repository search facility under the search menu. So I can search for Eclipse, everything that's been scheduled for the Milan 3.1 milestones, for example. So I click search, and I'll get a very fast search result back from the Eclipse repository. So let's take a bigger look at this. I can group these by the owner. And as you can see, all of this is explicit. Tasks have become this first class part of the IDE. They become as easy to navigate with files, and you've got this other benefit of offline editing for them, which is exactly what you expect with files. Even though they're in your source repository, when you're working on a plane, they're available. And what's even more important is that everything opens up instantly. You're never waiting for a task to open when you're working with Mylan because it's all cached offline. I'll just show you another, a few other little tricks for working with tasks. Um, first of all, Mylan makes it very easy to create tasks. And you end up making them readily. It brings in all sorts of task repositories in your workspace. So we've got Jira over here, Track and Edgewall. I've got some Bugzilla repositories as well as my local tasks right now. I can add a task repository using repository connectors, for example, an XPlanner repository right here. What ends up happening is that I'm able to bring in all of the collaborations that I'm doing into my task list and use this as an inbox and turn off my email notifications to avoid stuffing my actual email inbox with multiple notifications that don't show me what's going on. For example, don't show me the way this comment is shown up over here. So in Mylan, we've provided this focus facility for working with a task list. I'll show you what I mean by unfocusing my task list over here. Let's make a little extra space. If I unfocus my task list, you see all of the tasks that I have brought, that are related, brought in that are related to Mylan. So all of my tasks, there's actually a ton of them in Mylan. There's 1,700 altogether, and 309 are not complete yet. I've got tasks from every single person that I collaborate with closely. Here's Helen, who's been contributing to X Planner. I can see all of hers, as well as Stefan Tingle over here. So what we provide you with for managing this large volume of tasks is a focus facility where you can see just the tasks that are relevant to your work week. If I schedule this task for next week, it'll disappear. I, it won't appear in my task list until next week. Tasks scheduled for today appear blue. And I can easily switch the mode of the task list to show me what's been scheduled. So I, if I switch into the scheduled presentation, I see I've scheduled this for today. I can drag tasks around to reschedule them, of course, to move something to Friday. And now if I unfocus, so I'm focused on seeing only my work week. If I unfocus, I see everything I've got unscheduled. I would see things I've got scheduled for future weeks. And with a click, I can get back to the categorized presentation. So you just give this a try. We really recommend working with the focus mode once your task list gets, gets large. And flipping into the scheduling facility, if you're getting overloaded, if you're getting inundated with tasks, with incoming comments, this will help you focus on only what you need to see today. All right, so that's the core idea of Mylan, the, or the tasks idea of Mylan. You see how tasks get brought into Eclipse, and you see how tasks are a first class part of your workflow, and how you can bring in things like Jira issues, Collabnet issues. And we'll go over the different kinds of tasks connectors that we have later on in the talk. Now let's take a look at the really neat thing about Mylan, which is this idea of task context. We bring tasks into Eclipse so that we can focus you on what you're doing and I'll show you how that works right now. So let's make a new task, or let's take one of these existing tasks, which one we were looking at before, is this NPE. Um, so in the description of this task, we see that there's some kind of null pointer exception going on. So let's activate this task. You activate a task, activating a task indicates which task you're working on. So let's activate this task. We immediately see what we were doing when we left this task off. So all the editors are opened up. If we were navigating this null pointer exception to see what's going on, we get taken, of course everything's hyperlinked with Mylan as you might expect. Um, you get taken right to the offending place, and our context is restored in an instant. If we're nav so we can navigate from source code to tasks as well. I can say C bug 216049. 
and I can go back immediately to the bug. So we've got tasks and bugs linked, and we've got this really interesting idea of task context. So let me show you a little bit more about how task context works. If I select this context scaling factors, it gets added to my task. If I select this method parse event, it gets added to my task context as well. So over on the left, I'm seeing only the things that are part of my task context. And as I work and as I edit, things get added to my task context. I can actually focus all of my Eclipse views to show me only what's in the task context. I can focus my editor. These are the focus buttons in Eclipse. So if you click this button, I will now focus my editor to fold away all elements that aren't a part of my task context and leave everything else. Content assist, same thing. So we see the content assist list here. And everything that's on top of the list is what's interesting, is what's part of my task context. And everything else is below. You can still keep typing, but the really neat thing, that, neat thing about this is that the elements on top of the list can be quickly selected with the cursor. And let's get rid of this bogus change. Now if I start working on a new task, so let's start working on this content assist task, and I can use the alt click mechanism using my work. And this I'll see all of the classes in my workspace. I've got an enormous workspace right here. And I can start navigating by continuing to alt click and go class of interest and start navigating to the interesting method. So I click start, the method unfolds, becomes a part of my task. I click stop, and you see here how I'm building up this new task context. Now the best thing about these task contexts is that they get saved and you can instantly recall them, you can instantly go back to them. So I deactivate this task, my workspace goes back perfectly to normal, it's as if my own wasn't around, everything is back, if I activate it again, I'm exactly where I left off. I can keep using the alt click mechanism to discover new things that weren't here. Or if I want, I could actually unfocus this view completely to show me everything. But again, very quickly, this view will get blown up. And the really neat thing about it is that multitask and go click. So I go to my task switcher over here, which shows me the task history. The first task we started looking at was the NP and the Eclipse log file. With a click, I can get back to that. And this is exactly that, the code that we were looking at when we started this exercise. So that's the idea of task context. Everything that you touch becomes a part of your task context. This, I've shown you the examples for Java. We'll see in the talk, later in the talk, how it works for other kinds of resources for C++, for things like Spring and Fig files. But the idea is that you've got this degree of interest model that shows you what's interesting. It's actively managed as you work, so only the most interesting things stay in the model. If you click 100 search results, only the most relevant search results, those things that you edited, will be in the model. And then everything in the Eclipse UI is managed for you. So the open editors always correspond to the active task context. If you don't have Blur visible, always bring the task context using the context view um, here. And start typing, or if you want to navigate to get the handle identifier, we get there with a click. This is actually where we were. Um, and the really neat thing about it is that you can quickly jump around the different parts of your system relevant to your task without having to scroll, without having to navigate, without having to manage the expansion state of your views because this is now all managed for you. All right, now let's take a closer look at how Mylin supports your collaboration because that's another really important part of the tool and this is what really closes the loop on taking this idea of task focus and making it work for team development. So let's get back to this and take a look at the synchronized view. So what you see in the synchronized view is that the same task I've got up here has also appeared there. And then we've been make, playing around with making some changes. For example, we can make a change to this class as well. And now we see that the synchronized view is grouping all of my outgoing changes by task. If you go back to the first task that we went up, that we started working on, um, let's make some bogus changes here as well. We now see that this change set, this is the task context change set that's automatically managed for us, is grouping all the related changes by task. Now this is a 
this is a tremendous help if you're working in a team scenario because what it means is that if you've made some bogus changes, you can easily overwrite them. You can work with all your changes as a unit and the unit as a unit that's defined by your task, and they all get managed automatically. The most, um, the biggest benefits of this are that the fact that all your commit messages will get written for you. If you right-click a context change set. The commit message is written for us and includes a link back to the task ID. Uh, if it's written by a template that's configurable, for example, if we go to window preferences, we can go to the task section and under team, we see the template for writing these commit messages. You can quickly add a repository URL or all those sorts of things in this template. And that template will be used for writing and resolving your commit messages. With a click, we can override a set of changes or commit that set of changes without getting rid of the other changes that we have over here. This is really relevant. Um, and if we go back to our file, we can very quickly navigate these changes. So let's look at Mono UI plugin. Let's use the team annotations feature. So let's go show annotations. And look what happens when I see my history. I see links back to the task from my, from the annotations from the task history because all of this was managed with chain sets. If I go to the history view over here, I can with a click navigate to the task that was related to this change. Because there was a stack trace. In other words, what Mylon is doing is with this idea of task context and by monitoring your activity, by managing your chain sets, it's linking up all your changes to the tasks and making them navigable. Whether you're navigating from the source code to the task, you're navigating from tasks like bug reports to offending stack traces. All of that can now just be followed by clicking, by following hyperlinks. You no longer have to search for these things. You no longer have to look them up manually. And that can be a big productivity boost. It can be one of these major things that reduces friction and also keeps you in the flow because it gets you right to the source code that you need to see. I'll show you one more very relevant part of the team development in Mylan, and this is now about sharing task context. So let's look at this. Let me look at this task right here. Um, second level sorting of task list. This is Frank. He's been a frequent contributor to MyLine and been providing us a lot of useful patches. So if you look at this task, Frank has been attaching screenshots of his progress. He's been attaching patches. Patches MyLine allows you to apply with a click as well. You just click, it'll download. And we can use Eclipse's wizard for applying the patch right here. Also note that Frank has these task contexts. So what these task contexts are, are the context that Frank built up when he was working on this. On Mylan, for the contributors, we ask them all to always attach a task context with the patches that they provide. And I'll show you why right now. All we have to do is right click this, say retrieve context, and now I see exactly what Frank was doing when he was working, last working on this task. This makes it tremendously easier for me to apply the patch. I see exactly what he was referring to. I see the libraries that he was using. And the things that he accessed most are shown in bold. So the, these are the most interesting elements. And Mylan, they refer to as landmarks. Um, I could keep exploring what Frank was doing. If I want to show something, if I want to remove something from this task context, I can edit it directly. So I can say remove from context. If I want to sh show something else to Frank, say something there, that there's something in filtered tree over here that's really relevant to what he should see next. What I would do is go to dispose method. Instead of saying go look at the dispose method, I'll simply make this method a landmark. And I can do that with a keyboard shortcut or the context menu. Now Frank will know, go look at the dispose method. And then I can reattach this context simply by checking off attach context and submitting this bug back to the Eclipse bug build. So this makes collaboration, this makes interacting around code and around tasks and issues or however you define your work much dramatically easier. Because what you can do is you can ship off these contexts if a task is partly done, you just submit it, someone else can look at it. It's great when you're pair programming because you both build up a context and both people can see it when they go back to their machines. And it really helps streamline collaboration. Let's bring back our workspace back to normal. And there's just one last feature I want to show you. Um, this is for users who've, who've been using Marlin for a while now who might have built up a large number of queries. I just want to make sure that you're aware of the working set feature. This can be a, a huge time saver. Um, it also, actually also allows you to maintain a single Eclipse workspace in most instances of your work rather than maintaining multiple workspaces. So under here, the first thing that you see in the task list is 
the working set switcher. I've got a myelin working set. Let's actually just take a look at this myelin working set. Myelin working set has all my myelin queries over here. These are the task repositories. And everything under the Eclipse repository. If I switch working sets, look what happens to my markers list and my package explorer. So I'll switch to the task.pop working set. Everything has changed from org eclipse myelin to com.task.pop. The problems list is now actually showing problems because this build is not currently succeeding. And my task list is only showing me task.pop tasks. So with a click, I can get back to myelin and rearrange my entire workspace, the task list and all of the other views in Eclipse show me what's relevant to task stop. So this is this works very nicely with the idea of the task focus interface because you make these coarse grained working sets for yourself. You manage them in the task list. You see only the tasks relevant to that working set. It's very useful if you've got multiple task repositories especially. And then all of the clips will show you only what's relevant to that working set. Then when you click on the task to get back to what you were doing, you see only what's relevant to the task. So you can quickly hone in on what's relevant to you. And of course, the task histories are maintained per working set, so you can quickly go back to much older tasks that you were working on a long time ago. And this is really one of the big benefits of Mylan, that with a click, you can be right in the context that you were in six months ago when you fixed a bug, if that bug got reopened. Instead of relying on your memory, everything is explicit because it was all captured as you were working automatically. So, this whole idea behind Mylan is that it reduces friction and focuses you and puts you into such a flow that you get into the state where you're coding so much, so much faster than you would be if that weren't the case, if you were being slowed down, if you are being constantly distracted. It allows you to manage your interu interruptions and lets you offload your inbox by keeping all of that collaboration activity in the task list. And we named the tool after the substance of which insulate neurons. They can conduct up the dramatically speed from a lot of users that Mylan let them code at the speed of thought. And that's exactly why we named the tool after the substance that accelerates the way that you think, that makes it much easier to access information um, in our minds and in the systems that we work on. So that's the Mylan tool. And I've shown you the core framework and the core ideas. And really relies on integrating with two things to support your workday. If you just use Bugzilla, CVS, and Java, you're all set. You don't have to look any further in this webcast. If you use our systems, this is the part that will be relevant to you. Mylan has to integrate with your task repository and with the resources that you work with, so with the programming languages, with the XML files, those the things that you work with and the applications that you build. Now I'll show you where we've come over the past four years. We started out, or three years, I guess, we started out with Bugzilla and Java support. I showed you that today. That's how we bootstrapped the Mylan project. Then community contributions contribute to Jira and track support, as well as CVS. And this is really the Mylan integration for the core Eclipse SDK. This is what gets shipped with the default Eclipse downloads. And this is what you get. Um, this, these are all a part of the Eclipse project. The really neat thing that happened the year after that with Mylan, so this was uh, a, year, a year and a half ago, was that we saw a lot of other open source projects pick up Mylan to integrate with other systems using our APIs. So Mantis has now supported CodeBeamer, Subversive, and Subclips if you use SVN. And yet, the LTK project from Eclipse has provided support for dynamic languages like JavaScript and Ruby. The year after, we saw some more open source integration. So Spring IDE now has the ability to focus Spring artifacts like Spring XML. There have been more um, task repository connectors. And in Origin Italic there, you see all the commercial ecosystem, which is a really exciting thing. Because it means that the vendors of task repositories and the vendors of other tools are now supporting Mylan in addition to their web UIs so that all of your activity as a developer can be in Eclipse when you're talking to the web services. So some of the key ones there, Atlassian has been supporting the Jira connector, Rally, um, has been supporting the connector I'll show you in a minute. It's really neat because it supports agile development. Collabnet, all of Collabnet, um, Collabnet's issue trackers, the Shizilla, SFPE, uh, that source was identified edition. They all have Mylan connectors. And we've got things like Passtop having connectors for Outlook as well. I'll show you that in a moment. And IBM has a, uh, I think it's still an experimental connector for Jazz as well. So you should try that out. 
code gears and bundling some of the modeling connectors too. So let's take a quick look at the APIs that support this, in case you're interested in building modeling connectors. And we'll take a quick look at the showcase of these integrations. So we've got these core APIs, and those are monitor, core, and task. Monitor has to do with its degree of interest model, interaction monitoring. Context is the model of what we interact with. It's, it's actually the weightings of our interactions. It's, that's called the degree of interest model. Sorry, I just made a mistake. The monitor core is interaction events. It's, it's just the representation of events that we interact. The context model is the graph and the weighting of those events. And then we've got the task core model, which is our domain model for tasks. The neat thing about this is that this can be embedded in headless environments. And I'll show you in a moment how that can be done. What we have at the RCP level of Mylan, and that means it can be met in a rich, rich, rich client application, is a UI for monitoring the workbench. Uh, the context UI, which is how Mylan plugs itself into the various views that you see, so into the packet explorer, into navigator views, and the tasks UI, which provides the task list and task editors. So Jira, as an example, is an extension, has a core extension of task score, and that's really a Java library for talking to the Jira web service and the Jira UI, which is extension to the task editor and extension to the task list to support working with Jira. But still about track, all those repositories are, are very similar. And then we've got the other extensions, the monitor.usage, that's, that's a way of monitoring usage statistics that was used for the early user studies that determined um, that Mylan did provide a statistically significant increase in developers' productivity. Resources UI is how we track and track with resources. That's extended by the IDE UI in Java and so on. Team is another extension. So there's a Team UI extension for Subversion, for example. And the cool thing about this is you can unplug these things and reconfigure Mylan to different environments. So we've got a different configuration of Mylan in the Java packaging um, than we do in the JE packaging, or now in the CDP packaging that's available from Eclipse.org. So the, there's a Mylan bridge. That structure bridge is what extends the context UI. Um, that supports C++ programming in the same way that you saw me programming with Java. If you like, you can unplug all of these and stick them into an app server even. So you can have these task score or interaction monitoring um, or report over usage activity. Just a little quick note about the internals of how the task, of how the context UI works and how, how the monitor UI works um, and how this degree of interest model is managed. So think back to what happened when I was navigating. I selected the method. This method becomes a part of the degree of interest model. I select the class. I navigate to another class. The class gets added to my model, to the task context model, and the method decreases in interest. So every event causes a decay in interest of the other element, a decay in the degree of interest in this task context model. I navigate some more. There's some more decay. If I select the method again, or I edit the method, it becomes more interesting. This model evolves over time. Another neat thing it does is that it brings in structurally related elements. If I select a class, the package containing the class, and the source folder, they become interesting. So they can have interest induced on them. If you make a change, if you do a refactoring in Mylan 3.0, you'll notice that the files that you refactored will also become interesting. They'll so get added to your change set, they'll show in the package explorer, at least temporarily. Um, and you'll see, uh, for example, we'll give you an opportunity to fix an error if you made a change in the refactoring, or if you change, if change a file that affected other files and you want to see those changes. So this degree of interest model is built up as you work. It's built up by crawling the structure of the system in a very lazy way, so there's no performance overhead. There's no size overhead in storing these things. Um, and it's actively managed as you work to show you only the most interesting elements. For example, I've got tasks that I've had open that's like managing the website and updating that PHP code. Those I've had those tasks I've had open for two and a half, three years. Here's an example of how this model can be plugged into a swing application. So this is an example of taking out those core elements I showed you at the beginning. And this is a, um, a biomedical browser that was done at the University of Victoria called Protege that's using the exact same core element to focus both a tree view and a visualization on the task at hand. So the model is extensible and can be plugged in. There's a lot more work you have to do if you're not using SWT and JFace and the rest of the work country wide because we've done all that work for you for Eclipse-based applications. Here's how 
another quiz case application. The Collabnet Desktop integrates this. So this is Project Tracker, Social Code Enterprise Edition, and Ishizilla. All of them show up in the task list. Everything that you expect to work works exactly that you saw working for Bugzilla. That also works for Jira and Planet works for this tool as well. This is a great thing if you're one of the many Java.NET developers, for example. You can bring in those, all of those tasks into Eclipse. And this is really one thing I should mention, one of the key values of Milan 2 is that all of your tasks can be in a single place. So you can manage your work week in a single spot, no matter how many projects you work on, or no matter how many you know, open source projects you're interested in monitoring. Um, it's all in a single task list. This is the Rally connector. This connector, so you're seeing the usual focus thing, all connectors get the same things for free. Some connectors have interesting extensions. One of the really neat things about Rally, um, Rally is a web-based uh, project management system, agile project management system. So what you see in the task list is user stories, and then there's user stories, tasks, and defects. And the neat thing is it actually provides a rich editor, so you can embed screenshots in your user story description, and those sorts of things. Here's another really interesting application of the task-focused interface. This is the Spring Source tool suite. So, so far we've been looking at tasks as things that, as bugs and issues and those sorts of things. The Spring Source tool suite takes another point of view. Tutorial steps become the tasks that you're doing in one of the Spring Source tool suite features. So here we're walking through what's new in Spring 2.5, and for each step, of this tutorial, I automatically get a task context activated. So I'm looking at annotation based, the annotation based MVC controller step, and I see all of the parts of the sample application, all of the spring beams focused in the exact same way that we were seeing the Java code focus. Um, and I can walk through this tutorial, seeing the code that's relevant to each step. We call these things task focused tutorials. It's just one of the really neat ways that the Spring Source tool suite build on Mylan to bring the idea of task focus to learning about a system in addition to working on the system. And then there's TaskTop. So the neat thing about TaskTop is it shows you how far you can push this task context model. I'll just give you a really quick demonstration of that because I work with TaskTop every day. So here we are. TaskTop adds a, a bunch of additional features to Mylan. You get, um, you get things like email integration for Gmail and for Outlook. Um, so let's just look at the Gmail integration. This is going to be available for, uh, for free in the TaskTop Starter Edition that's going to come out soon. So let's look at things referring to TaskTop. So I've got a Google Alert task here. Let's activate this Google Alert. Let's see what's in it. In this Google Alert, I see that I've got um, a bunch of comments over here and Google New Alerts there. So I can open these up and I can click these hyperlinks. This is the Gmail connector for TASA that comes from the Mylan connector for Gmail, which means just the same way that I saw Bugzilla message threads, I'm now seeing Gmail messages rendered with a web browser. And look what happens when I navigate to this. I get taken to my blog, and this web page becomes a part of my task context. If I navigate to local productivity on, let's say, Wikipedia, I can navigate some more. So here's the productivity page. We've got a full featured browser in Eclipse, by the way. Um, and I go to the section depicting the development time. I see that Wikipedia, in addition to the TaskTop website, are a part of my task context as well. I can navigate my desktop files. Those are brought in too. Let's grab something from the desktop, like this image. And I'll click works for all those things as you expect. And what you're seeing is that the same task context model, the same degree of interest model, it works for other kinds of resources. It works for web navigation structure. It works for files in the same way that it works for Java code. And that's exactly what these Mylan connectors provide. So what this means is that if I deactivate this task, my workspace goes back to normal, like it did with a Java code. And now if I go back to this task and open it up, I'm instantly where I left off, even though what I was looking at is web resources. All my browser tabs were instantly restored, and I actually went back to the exact section of the wiki page that I was looking at the same way that I went to the Java code that I was looking at previously when I switched tasks. And this, as you can imagine, this can be very useful if you're reading blogs at the same time as you're programming, or if you're looking at Java docs or tutorial articles. 
those things become a part of the task context. You can share them with others if you want without having to dump a bunch of hyperlinks to them. So in a nutshell, what's happening with Myelin and with the extensions built on top of Myelin is that we're seeing a transformation in the way that we work. Tasks become a first class part of the user interface. The same way that files became the first class part of the user interface about 30 years ago, tasks, the things that we work on, in addition to the resources that we produce and the things that we have to read and write, basically the files and directories, are now a first class part of the UI. I'll just give you some stats of a, from a 30-day snapshot in the life of the Mylon project. We had 506 bugs that we interacted on, and 147 of those had task context swapped back and forth. So this, this kind of interaction is critical to the Mylon project, and it's exactly how we're able to apply dozens of community patches a month. So our tool is what enables us, to, and the task focus is what enables us to build Mylon to help it evolve with all the feedback and contributions we've been getting. And the exact same way of working works at TaskTop at, at my company for development. So we went through 399 development tasks and for other sorts of tasks as well. So in operations, we work in the exact same way. And task focus gives us the exact same benefit. So we go away from this world where friction and distraction are dominating our workday, where we've got these multiple windows, where we've got like, multiple sources of information, where we're constantly all tabbing or switching between browsers, restoring browser tabs, and we're doing the same searches over and over and over, and looking through long hierarchies, whether they're in our packet explorer, whether they're on our desktop, very large hierarchies of folders, managing all this disparate information. And instead, we have this one focused view in Eclipse, where all the information is at our fingertips, and where we can multitask with a single click, whether we're programming or switching between programming and other activities, like blog, blogging or reading or writing talk. So we move into this world where float focus and flow are what dominate. And in the end, the nice thing is that makes us happy and productive. And we get this dramatic increase in productivity from this way of working. So that's the idea behind Mylan. I urge you to go try out Mylan 3.0. We've got, I only had a chance to cover the core features Take a look at the Mylon new and noteworthy to get a check, to get a look at all the new features that have added in Mylon 3.0, all the additions streamlined that's been done. And watch our task blog for more information about what's going on with the task focus interface and how we'll be allowing you to reclaim your workday more and more as we go on. Thank you for watching.